good evening. Uh, I greet you all. I uh, show my appreciation for you attending uh, today. I kind of took my time getting down here from where I was sitting because I don't have quite enough material for today. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, well, I guess, you know, the, the first thing I could... I'll start with uh, who I am. First of all, I'm from Ghana. And uh, so that's, in the books, it's the Blood Reserve number 148 between Lethbridge, Cardston, Fort McLeod, and the surrounding towns. Now, we, we don't really call ourselves the Bloods anymore. It's, it's usually everybody says Kana. So, me, it's a Kana Kuan, which means Kana, a Kuan is like the progeny of these people. I'm from those people. Kanekon. And a woman would be a Kanaki. A, a K I ending. So that's, uh, we don't really have gender in, in our language. We only use gender when we really have to use it. Like if we're talking about a female or a woman, then we'll say Aki or Akikon. But generally speaking, we don't use gender. Um, so where the name Kanai came from, it goes back to some origin stories about, uh, first of all, there's Siksika, and there's Kanau, and then there's Pikani. Pikani has two divisions. There's the north, which is the Apatoksi Pikani, and then the south, or Amskapi Pikani. Now we tend to understand Amskapi as on the state side or to the south side. And the Apatos is the north we call Apatos Pohots. So that's where it's situated. And it, and it appears in our language we have this uh, a north south orientation. So Remember the directions here. Okay, north is over here. So, um, so when I say apatxochts, the only way that can be apatxochts would be because you just came from there. So if I if I came up to here, I just came from there. That's apatxochts. So if I walk backwards, I would say apatxochts. So, so there appears that, you know, that we have that uh, orientation where we're facing south. Now, so those, those are the tribes. They have, uh, you know, more recently, some of the stories have been kind of skewed or, you know, taken in the wrong direction. Like they say, Ikani today, we it's it's more teasing each other. There's a concept we call exemotio. Uh, exemotio, it's like a derision of each other, but it's in a joking manner. These things sometimes there's a bit of truth in it, and uh, so now when we say Ikani, we we'll say oh Ikani, their name Ikani because their women were too too lazy to properly tender hides, which isn't true, but that's what we we tease each other about. And then where I come from, Ghana is a short version of Akana. And Akana, it's interpreted as many chiefs. So the teasing there is that, yeah, when we go down to Ghana and ask, where's your leader or your chief, and they, they, they claim that they're the chief. So everybody's a nina, so a kena, many ninex. And then Siksika, they said this because they're always burning the grass, and then their moccasins are always black from that burnt grass. So there's these different things. 
those go back to Ksemwatsis and that, that derision of each other. And it, it serves a purpose, it keeps us humble. Um, but the real stories I've, I've, I've come across um, in at least two sources, they tell the same, basically the same story. That six ago, Kano uh, and uh, Bikani, so there's three of them. Of course, now there's the two divisions of Bikani because they separated. They, one group couldn't get along with the larger group, so they moved north. And uh, so there was a time where this old man uh, took his sons out onto the plains and uh, because where they're situated at, uh, we would say those people, awawakasi piskia. Awakasi means deer or elk. You know, the, those, those types of animals, that's the class of them, awakasi. And then there's more specific names for them, like Puluka, Sikhtiso, Awatoyi, Isikotoyi. So now then we start getting specific as to which ones they are. So, Awakasi Piskiya. Now this Piski goes back to the Piskan. So there are in the story at that time they're they're uh, they're using deer pound to provide food for their people and they started running out so they moved a little further south and that's when this old man uh was with them and his three sons they came out onto the plains and saw all of these well a multitude of these animals they didn't quite recognize and that was the Ini or the buff, the bison. So they thought, well, there's lots of animals here. We're going to have lots to eat. But then they tried to trace them down. They couldn't catch up. So uh, they were just as bad off as when they started. And I don't know how long it was, but eventually the old man uh, had a dream where the sun gave him some black paint and that black paint he was instructed to paint his oldest son his oldest son's uh, moccasins or feet with that black paint and if he did that then they would be able to catch up to those bison what we know as the buffalo today and uh, so he did that, and then that oldest son chased these buffalo down, and they finally got food. So because of that black paint, we call black Sikki, and something that looks like Sikki, we say Sikhsi Natsi. Natsi means it appears like, or looks like. So it appears like that Sikki, that black paint. And black paint is usually associated with uh, um, I don't know how to put it, but you know, for successful warriors, they would use black paint. And also associated with, with the sun, like when we, let's say if I, if I made an offering up the tip of my finger, I would paint, paint it black first. And that's what I would offer and we would know it's going to the sun. And you may have seen in some photos or paintings where these warriors have these black lines on their leggings. Well, that's, those are lives that are being offered to the sun. And the sun had instructed Scarface to do that. So the sun gives life. So when we take a life, we give that life back to the sun. So we don't just uh, waste that life. So anyway, you know, you go back to Six Guy when he painted his uh, his moccasins black. He became known as Six which means the one with black feet. 
So his other sons were somewhat jealous and they're asking their father in a way, why can't you give us some of that paint so we can be as successful as he is? And he said, well, you know, that paint was made, uh, meant for the oldest son. So I can't just arbitrarily give it to somebody else. And uh, so he told them, you, you have to go seek out your own way of life. Now I'm interpreting from the back, but what we would say, so literally it means you have to chase down your own way, your own life. So make way for you, you know, your, make your own way. So those two other sons then decided to, you know, I guess, you know, that's what we'll have to do. And the one son went far away. And when he came back, he had this really fancy robe from a far off place. So that, that robe, we would say, um, Gan, which means far off robe. So in some of the stories they say, you know, that name Pikan is far off robe. But when you look as well, that, that robe that he brought back was a very fancy robe. So any of our fancy belongings, let's say I have uh, some pants and blankets that I, that I really like. I'll put them aside and they're always there. Maybe I might have a fancy saddle, a nice knife, rifle. Well, I would call those ni, ni is me, pikan, ni pikan. So that, that robe could be a call, you know, that, that young man could have said ni pikan. So that's what I, you know, that it, so this is a long time ago. We may never get to the right answer, but for me, linguistically speaking, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it means speak on one of the fancy robe rather than the far off robe because it fits these other things that we talk about. And then Ken now, that young man went off to war. Again, he too is pursuing his, his life. And he came back with many scalps on acoustic and those scalps we call so toxin were the things we took off. He had many of those when he came back. So they called him again now. Again means lots. Now that uh, that na comes from nina. So in one of the stories they talk. Um, they say it came from, those scalps came from many chiefs. But again, that's kind of a erroneous uh, translation. Where Nina comes from, even though I'm a male, an adult male, then we would, today we'll call an adult male Nina. And boys, Sakumag. But what Nina really means is that person has a coup. So that, that young man that went off, each one of those scalps that he had is a coup. In Blackfoot, we would refer to them as ninnite sin. So, a go, he had many of those ninnite seasons. So it's many accomplishments. And uh, so that, then we say a can now. So it doesn't mean many chiefs, because Nina today, that's how it's being interpreted. It means, it means a very accomplished warrior. So the, our real name was many accomplished warriors. When you, you know, check the language around that, that's what it really adds to. And Sikrika, it's not because of the burnt grass, it's because of that paint that you got, that came from the sun and the Pitani it came from acquiring this this fancy robe from a far out place. So through through that that derision and teasing each other, they've changed to those not so good uh, explanations of the different names. 
and, and in the process we've kind of forgotten about those names. So these Ninais, that's what also also makes a makes me a Nina. So it's not just being a man, it's about being accomplished. So that also tells us that in order to be a real Nina, you have to pursue many things and be successful at it. Then you become a real Nina. Now, when we come short of something, we say, um, uh, or he came short of it. So a Sakhkina is a man that has, hasn't quite accomplished enough. So he's a little bit short of being a Nina. So we call them Sakhkina. So if I stayed at home and never did anything, even though I'm in my age right now, I would be a Sakhkina because I never accomplished anything. But the accomplishment afforded me the name of Nina or the reference of Nina. So those are lessons that are that have been lost over time because we don't quite understand our language as well uh, as we did many, many years ago. So that's that's who we are. And then the, the newcomers like there there's Tsotena. We had our own name for them, which wasn't so good, which eventually turned to Sarsi. And that's another story around around the language. Um, so we call them Sarsi, which meant in our eyes, they weren't you know, such good people because they came from a long way away. So they left their traditions behind. They no longer had those traditions and what we saw was strange to us. So that's why we call them Sakshi. And um, and some of the explorers and uh, you know would write out that name uh, where Sarsi came from was it came from the spelling S A R S I. S-A-R-S-I. Well, in French, that R is actually a H. It's not a R. So, so that French spelling is Sarsi. They're spelling out to what we call them. And, uh, but because people weren't understanding that this is a French spelling, they started saying Sarsi, and that's where Sarsi came from. And now, rightfully so, <clears throat> I heard uh, one of the elders had, was curious. I don't know how, how long ago it was, but his wife is actually from Sikhsuka, had gone to Sikhsuka and asked some elders, so what does Sakshi really mean? They told him what it really meant. He said, well, it just means, you know, not so good. So then that's when Tsukdena was picked up and that and that's their correct name. It should have been Sotena all along rather than Sarsi. That's a Blackfoot name. And uh, <clears throat> I know in some material it's also spelled S A X and I think that's the Dutch spelling because the, the Dutch they have a, a two different X looking letters that are and or depending on where they, they are after an O or H, they have, they have that uh, as well. So we have to be careful, you know, when we uh, when we identify people or, you know, when we see these names, they can be er erroneous if we don't really examine them. Sometimes we get a little bit, a little bit lazy and we just accept what's there. And I know a lot of fellow researchers that do that, and I have to kind of take them to task and say, you got to check a little bit further. Don't just accept things at face value. <clears throat> so those are our names, and that's where I, uh, I come from. And I have relatives in all of these, all the different, uh, among the Stony, Sutena, Tsikau, Tsikapi Pikanya, Patsipikani, of course, I'm from Ken. But it was only the borders that separated us, why we think we're different people, but we're not. I have, uh, I was talking to a young man from uh, 
Blackfeet, Montana. He was asking a lot of uh, lang Blackfoot language questions, and um, and then he got into um, relationships and people that were related to you know in our genealogy. So I gave him a bunch of names. I said, these are the people that I've been told that I'm related to down in, in Montana. And in the end, he said, wow, you're related to thousands of people down here. He said, you're probably related to almost everybody in, in Blackfeet, Montana. So that's, you know, just shows how we were actually, you know, all pretty much the same people. A great uncle of mine said at one time, which means we placed each other in strategic locations to protect our our territory. He said that's why we were spread out like that. And uh, and this land we call Nitochsinan. Nitochsinan. Now, Nitoch Sinan literally translates to our food source. And I immediately think about the Sioux when they talk about the uh, Black Hills. They refer to the Black Hills as their food basket. They know that when they're, they, don't, they don't have food, they can always go back to the Black Hills. It was a very important place for them. So that's how we treat this land, Nitoch Sinan. It sustains us in many different ways. Well, that's why it's it's so important to us. And uh, so as, as a people, the Siksika, Pikani, Kaenna, we came from this land. In the origin story for our spirits, our souls, we were, uh, that story, uh, is that there's two whirlwinds blowing around. Now, this old man from uh, Kana, where I come from, his name was Makuyo uh, Butstaki, or Wolf, uh, Wolf, Choking Wolf. Konots, um, Makuyo Sokstaki, Wolf Stripping Bones. He, uh, he was telling this story, and he was pointing north, and he said, And he didn't say it was very far from the blood reserve. He just said, you know, a little north of here, is where this occurred. And he said, there was two, two whirlwinds that were blowing around on the landscape by, this, uh, by the banks of this uh, not so prominent waterway. And the way he said it in Blackfoot, that itchta comes from nitchta. That's what we call waterways, rivers. And mats um, pakita means it wasn't very prominent or not so important. So it must have been maybe a creek or maybe a very small river. He said. So these two whirlwinds were playing around on the banks of that waterway. And then they heard this commotion up on the flat. So they peeked over and there was a little hill and they saw two groups of people coming around that hill. And they were looking at it, looking at these people. And then one of those Buka geeks, that's what we call the whirlwind Buka geeks. The Buka geeks, we're looking at the people. And the one Bukaki, and they're still blowing around there, this one Bukaki told the other Bukaki, let's watch these people here. Sooner or later, we're going to have to become human. And we need Aksnoxistscope. Aksnoxistscope means we have to select a mother from who we're going to be born from. So let's watch them, and we'll pick the two most we'll pick the two most uh, industrious women in these two groups, and those will be our mothers, and from them we'll be born and become human. But 
the one Bukaki disagreed and he said, no, I don't, I don't like that idea. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with being born and all that, but I think we should take separate mothers because it's too risky. If the one woman has twins, there's a high, that's a high risk pregnancy. One of us might not make, maybe both of us won't, or maybe none of us will make it through. So it'll be safer if we, you know, select different mothers. So, they agreed to that and then they're watching these, uh, these women putting up the teepees. So it's during that period, it's just the women that, you know, took care of the teepees. And uh, they said the first ones that get their loads off and have their teepee up and have the interior all set up, those are, will know those are the most industrious mothers and that's who will select. So they watched, and the first two women that had their lodges up, those were the ones that they selected as their mother. And from, from those two women were born these two Pukakiks. And the story that this old man was talk, uh, telling, he said, the one Pukaki that was born was six ago. That's where six ago got their spirit. And then the other one was Kaena. That's where we got, we got our spirits during that, you know, that event there. Now, I, I, after that, I used to wonder, well, how come Ikani was never mentioned? Do they have a separate story or what? But, you know, in the year before I moved up here to Calgary, which is uh, well, just in the area of Calgary, I spent a year in Conquering and five here. Um, but that year prior to me moving up here, I spent a lot of time with some elders like uh, Pete Standing Alone, Ed the Heavy Shield, uh, a number of them, I can't name them all. Um, I, you know, spent many hours just sitting there having coffee with them and they would tell them stories. So one day I was alone with uh, Ed Heavy Shield. It was getting close to Christmas, so not all of the elders were showing up, um, you know, to visit those days. So Ed and I were sitting there and I was thinking out loud and I, I told that story to him. And uh, he was a chain smoker, so that's the one part that was tough for me when I would visit all day with him is because every time he lit up a cigarette, he gave me a cigarette. <laughs> so by the end of the day, I was, you know, pretty sick from the smoke. So anyway, on one of those days, I was thinking out, I told him the story that I just told and then I was thinking out loud, I wonder what, why Pikani wasn't mentioned in that. And of course he was smoking, smoke rising, and then he took his cigarette, put it in his mouth, he had one eye closed, smoke rising, and he just went like this. And I knew he was saying, doesn't matter, we're all one. So even though only two of them K96 Skyver mentioned the same story applies to Pikani. That they got our spirit or soul from from this place somewhere in, in this area. So but I didn't totally accept his comment just yet. I wanted to check around some more and then I eventually came across more evidence where these uh, North and South Bikani old men were, were telling stories and then there's some old women too. And uh, they refer, they didn't refer specifically to that story, but the beliefs around it, like things like, if the women back then, and even not too long ago, uh, if they saw a bukaki, a whirlwind coming in their direction, they would cover their, cover their mouths and hold their skirts down because if they got hit by that, that whirlwind and they didn't do that, then they were sure to have a child not long after that. Or in the Pikani, they, they would chase their uh, single daughters into their lodges till that, 
that Bukowski passed by. So then, you know, all of what they're talking about then confirmed, oh, it's exactly the same beliefs around Bukowski. So just like Ed said, it doesn't matter, it's all of us. Even though in that story, the other old man told me it was Canada and Sixika, but it applies to all all of the four, the four tribes, North Bikani, South Bikani, Sixika, and Canada. So when we go back to uh, the land acknowledgements, well, there's a whole lot more to it than just claiming the territory. We actually, our spirit came from this landscape. And what causes those, um, what causes those whirlwinds? Well, it's the sun heating up the air and it creates this vortex of energy. And that's why we, we call the sun the source of life or that which gives us life. So that's who we speak to every day so that we, we can continue to live here and for the sun to give us long life and it gives everything life. So, you know, that's, that's the land right there and our spirits coming from our names where they came from. And like I said, there's a whole lot more to you know, than just the land. Uh, there's a story that, uh, not actually a story, he was just talking, my, my great uncle, uh, George Verstrider, actually he's my uncle, I, but because my dad re refers to him as his uncle, because he was much older than him, I referred to him as my great uncle. And uh, so he was talking about, uh, about medicine. And today, when we talk about medicine, uh, the word we use is psalm. If we're going to acquire medicine, itaka psalm. So he said it's not strictly just medicine. And he said, you know, when we go out and hunt, we don't say, I'm going to go kill an animal so we can eat it. We say, this, now this is the, the older Blackfoot. Now things have kind of shifted some. We use the language a little bit different. But the old Blackfoot, Itayak Sam means I'm going to go hunt. And it literally means I'm going to get some medicine. And so when we hunt this animal, acquire that animal, it's been eating all of these different plants. It's been drinking the water and so on. So that it's taking all the best things from, from the land, our food source. And so his body becomes medicine. So we acquire its body so that we can have that medicine that it's accumulated through eating all of these different plants. And then he went on to say, he said, that's not the only medicine that we have. You see that stone that's on the ground, that's, that's medicine too, psalm. You see those shoots of grass, that's psalm. You see that dirt, that soil, that's psalm. That air that we breathe, that's psalm. See those berries that we eat, that's psalm. Even those bugs that crawl around in the soil, those are psalm. And of course the animals. And then you have the different plants that we actually call psalm. They're, you know, they're, they're healing plants that we use for different things. And then he said, in the water, psalm, the sun, psalm, the moon, psalm, kukus, during the night, the stars that we see, psalm, the sky, psalm. And he could have gone on and on and on, but he said, so all 
Everything around us is psalm. Um, it's all medicine. So essentially what she was saying is it's uh, we've really changed our understanding of what medicine is. Today, and I'm saying this, he didn't say this, but I'm saying it. Today when we talk about psalm, well, first thing I think of is, oh, am I, I uh, pulled my hamstring on the way here this evening in the snow. <laughs> Um, so tomorrow I'm going to uh, go see the doctor and I'll tell them what my ailment is, this is how it feels, tell them about all my symptoms. I might even trump it up a bit just so I can get stronger some. <laughs> and uh, then you'll say, okay, this is what's wrong with you, you've got pain and I need something for the inflammation, you might need some... Uh, uh, some rub to help it too, and uh, so he'll give you a prescription. Then I head down to the uh, the pharmacy, hand it over, wait a few minutes, and now I've got my psalm. And it's in a container about this big. So our understanding of psalm has come from everything. Everything is psalm to now it's just the little vial. So it's really taking us away from what, you know, the, the notion that everything we need to be well as needs it up, he needs it up, he's real people. So everything we need as needs it up, he's all around us. And then we also have specific plans for different things. But we've forgotten that. Now it's going to the doctor and getting those bills. And the other thing he said was um, knowledge, some. Knowledge is medicine too. No, I, I really believe in these things. I don't, I don't take very many medications unless something's really bad, but for the most part I'll just kind of work my way through it and even that thinking about be okay goes a long way in, you know, helping with those ailments. So the changes in language over time have really affected how we see things. And uh, earlier I was talking um, about uh, the Blackfoot Dictionary. You look through the dictionary and it's, it's translated, here's the English, here's the Blackfoot. So it's really now become English Blackfoot instead of really understanding what that word is. Like my favorite example, and I, in our little talk up, I'm in discussion up here where I said, you know, for instance, itasuyo. In the, in the uh, Blackfoot Dictionary even, um, when you look at it, uh, it'll have the translation as table. But really, we're not saying table. What we're saying is, it's something I eat over the surface of. So if there's a tree stump that I eat regularly on, well, that's an itasoyo, but nobody would see that as a table. If I use one of these chairs as my regular place to eat on, that's itasoyo. Same thing with itasopo, something we sit, sit over the surface of. Could be a tree stump, a bucket. It's not limited to just a chair. And even when I talked about Kano, you know, it's not as simple as many chiefs, you know, there's, there's accomplishments behind that title. And if we really understand that, that, that encourages our, our young men especially to accomplish something just so they can afford the title that's freely given today of Nina when they get older. Back in the day, you couldn't be called that unless you accomplished something. And somebody that was very accomplished, then we would say, Nita Pitna, or that's a real uh, high, highly accomplished man. 
No, I just want to go back to when I said Nichitapi. Now Nichitapi, I remember the the late Narcissus Blood talking about he uh, he had used the word Nichitapi and somebody had asked him, uh, so what does it mean? He said, well, real people, that's what we call ourselves. So this this lady got really upset, the mainstream lady got really upset with him. He said, what do you mean? You're, are you saying that you're the only real people and the rest of us are fakes? Or, <laughs> and he told him, no, that's not what I meant. What we mean is, see, I, I talked about the spirits, right? So when the spirits took a human body, they became a physical form. They became real. You could touch them. And you can't touch a spirit. So we became real. We, uh, essentially, you could also say we became human. We weren't just spirits anymore. So he had to explain that. I don't know if she settled down, but <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's what we mean by, it It doesn't mean that we're the only real people. That's just our reference to ourselves, that we became real, we became physical, we became human. Prior to that, we're Buka Geeks. Now, those Buka Geeks that were born from those women, when they were born, so they're Buka Geeks, whirlwinds, Buka Geeks. When a child is born, we say a boka wapsi, has become a boka or boka. And a woman, this is sign language for birth, so when a woman gives birth to a child, then we say that woman, a boka me, has a child, has a boka. It goes back to those spirits. And also for the same reason, now this one is, this word is being, this reference is being forgotten by most people, but I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged because I've heard a few young ladies call each other, um, see us men will say to another man, will say Napie, not Napie, but Napie, that means my friend. But women, when they address each other, they'll say, Buka. Buka. So it's acknowledging that, you know, they gave birth to those spirits. That's why they're the ones that give birth, so they're Buka. And the child, when they're born, when you have a young child, a baby, then we'll say, uh, we call them Buka. So it all traces back to those whirlwinds. Buka, buka mi, buka wa shi, buka, buka. They're all tied together. And if we, you know, if, if we didn't uh, reference those stories or if we lost those stories, it's just going to become child, woman, or my friend. We lose, because they're, they're all interconnected. Same with the, the psalm, how everything is interconnect. Now, one of the, I also had this outstanding question that somebody had asked me, why do you call Nose Hill, Nose Hill? And uh, I, I really didn't know. I said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with living here, and I'm not from Chicago. They're closer to Calgary than I am. Maybe they, they would know better. And uh, I suppose I could have made something up, but, <laughs> but that, that would be wrong. Um, and that was one of the things that the elders that taught me, they always told me, no, minikrista bipartut means don't take it off in the wrong direction. Or meaning, you know, don't make stuff up so it's not even tied to what the reality is. Kibada uh, know, means our way of life. So minikrista bipartut, kibada biyosino, don't take our way of life in the wrong direction. So we have to remember those things. So. Uh, 
or remembering that, I couldn't make anything up. <laughs> so I started asking around. Then I came across a story about, uh, uh, I don't know, it must have been around the mid 1900s. Uh, this man, nothing from the city of Calgary, had asked this uh, man from Sixika, why do you call Nose Hill, Nose Hill? And that man told him, uh, well, that's because we have a chief that had a really big nose. And his nose looked like Nose Hill. So that's why we called it Nose Hill. <laughs> So anyways, funny story, but then I thought, I wonder, you know, in, in these stories, there might be a smidgen of truth. And of course, that old man maybe didn't speak, you know, adequate English. So the way it came out was kind of <laughs> comical. So I got thinking about it, and I couldn't figure it out, little hints here and there. And then up at the gathering up at uh, Medicine Hill, we were sitting there, and Bruce Wolf Child, Brian, uh, you, you're, you know him, and uh, he was talking uh, to uh, Lorna Crowshue, and he said, you know, they call this, uh, there's a man that used to be, that used to live, it was his very, uh, his favorite campgrounds, somewhere in that area. And they called him Spius Christi. Spice, because he means, you know, big, long nose. Spice. And then he was joking around. He said he had a, he had a nose like uh, the ski jump right here, like uh, Bob Hope. <laughs> so when I heard that, uh, I thought, well, you know, that, you know it, there's a little bit of, more of a hint there, too. There's a man Maybe he didn't get the right location, but it was somewhere in that general area where this man with a big nose lived. And uh, not long after that, my uh, friend and cousin, uh, Paul Meltingtal, who I was telling him, you know, that I've been trying to figure out where that name came from. And I told him these stories, and I told him about how this, in the mid-1900s, how this old man had told uh, the mainstream man, uh, we call it Nose Hill because it looks like that big nose chief's nose. And then Paul said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a, there was a, one of our leaders, his favorite wintering grounds was where Nose Hill is right now. And he said, and that chief, and I, he might have said running rabbit, I know the two that he mentioned, that one of them was Running Rabbit, that also camped there. So it might have been him. And he said, and that old man did have a big nose. <laughs> so all of these little stories had a little bit of truth in them, but we just had to uh, track down the real story around it. So according to uh, my cousin Paul Meltingtel, that's probably the closest right now is that it's because of that chief that wintered there that had a big nose why they call it so that old man you know had part of the truth in his story and then uh, the bow river was a favorite place to get uh Namax. oh no, not Namax. Namai. Namai is a, is a bow or a weapon. Namai. When the firearms came, they were also a weapon, so we just applied that bow, the name for the bow, Nama, and we changed it a bit to Namax. So now the rifles became Namax, firearms in general. Nomex, or as the original boast, Nam. And so the the Bow River was a a favorite place. Of, um, well, they they used to get some really good bow material in the area. And the other river, I'm not 
I'm going to speak too much too. I mean, they say it's, you know, there's, it's the crook in that. There's another guy from uh, Pekan, he was telling those stories. He was saying, if you look at the landscape, you see a man with a bow and then there's a woman as well. But, you know, I've never confirmed if any of what he said, but that was kind of an interesting thing too. His name is Stan Dalton from Pekan. Now, I spoke to the Nidhtaist, like I said, it wasn't very prominent or very important. And we call waterways Nidhta. If it's small, then it's Asidhta, or small or, or young. Asidhta, Nidhta. Well, the important part is that Nidhta. Nidhta. So there's, you know, there's kind of different nappies, you know, there's the trickster and then there's the other, another one they call the creator. My great uncle said, oh, that's not the same nappie, they're not the same. One is just a dirty old man, <laughs> and the trickster, and the other one's more, you know, more serious. And uh, so when that nappie was creating the landscape, you know, he gave certain roles or places where different animals would live. And then rules were set out to, for us, things like, you don't eat the clawed animals, you eat the cloven hoof animal. Because if you eat the others, it's not good for you. And, uh, So when it came down to the, to the rivers, that Nabi used his finger and he scratched the earth. So if I scratch this table, that mark I leave, I'll say, Idhta, or Nidhta, how I scratch my finger across the surface. That's that mark I left. So does that scratch and then when the water comes down from the mountains, it follows those gouges that that not be. So that's why we call them Nidhta. That's the mark that was left, and the waters followed that. <laughs> now, I want to go back to, uh, before I forget that part, when I said, when that old man and the three sons came out onto the plains and saw the, the buffalo, Prior to that, awawakasibiskiya. So awakasi literally, mean, literally means awokasi. So if you see any one of you know the uh, of the deer family, like the elk, the deer, when they antelope, when they walk or run, they go like this. Awokasi. So that's why we call them awaka. It's changed over time to Awakasi, but originally it was Awokasi. And then there's this, like I said, there's specific animals. So when they were, before they came here, they were uh, Awakasi Piski. So that Piski is the, they're used, that means they're using Piskan. Piskan is an enclosure. We've used that to more modern times for fencing. So if we have a board fence made out of wood, we'll say misci piska. If it's metal, we would say, I mean iron, then we would say mikskim. Mikskim means iron. Mikskim i piska. So it's a steel enclosure. So with what he said now, we know that that's what they're using. And I have seen them in illustrations, like in the woods where they have those uh, deer ponds. So I suspect that, you know, the area that he's talking about back then was probably around red deer because we call red deer 
Bonoka, that river. Bonoka is the Sakta because there are so many elk there. But I say we call the deer Bonoka. It's supposed to be the elk. The elk is called the Bonoka. And the two different deer, one, Awatoyi, that's, can you tell which one that is? Which deer? It's the white tail, it always waves. So Awatoyi means it waves its tail. And then the, the mule deer, a Sikutoyi, that Sik comes from that black. Doyi means tail, so black tip tail. That's the mule deer. In six guy they, they apply um, a sikutui to both. But in Kana we have it's a sikutui and awatui. But they're all awoka. And then the punuka. The punuka I never put too much thought into it till more recently when I was thinking about the Ukan, which is our, that sun lodge, the woman vows to put up. It, you know, they don't put it up every year. It's only when the woman vows to put that up, either because somebody's sick in the family or for some other reason. I know the last one, it was for the community because of so many things going on. They made that vow. She made that vow. So Punuka, oh God, there's a story about this elk. His, his uh, elk wife left him and went up. My great uncle says it, it's likely somewhere west of Edmonton. So that, that jealous bull elk went to look for his wife and found her up there. And then they had a challenge. And uh, so the bull elk said, you know, who, he, he said, I want you to come back home. I know you're not cheating on it, but then on top of that, then he puts a condition on it. We'll see who knocks this tree down. And then whoever tree, uh, knocks down that tree is the one telling the truth. So him being big male and muscular, he thought, well, I'm going to, I'll go first thinking he would just knock that the tree down, but it, it was just bending. He wasn't able to knock it down. Finally, he became too exhausted. He gave up and he told his, his uh, female elk wife, okay, well then you try. And that female went over there and bumped it a couple of times and knocked it down. And then finally, the, the bull elk said, well, I guess you were telling the truth then. And prior to that, he had taken away her eyes because he didn't, he didn't want her looking at other bull elk. So he, she went away blind. And when she find, they finally set things straight, then that bull elk gave her eyes back to her. And um, so now when you look at the elk, you'll see a big pit under its eyes. It's quite large, and uh, we call that Oswa Beach, or the change of eyes. So it left empty sockets there from the time that that bull took the eyes, and he put them above those other sockets. So we call it the change of eyes. So that's what happened when they went up there and then they came back and uh, so we have this Ukan that that woman vows to put up. There's aspects of that, that story throughout that ceremony. So that bull elk losing his wife and that it's, today I'm starting to think it means um, the one that lost his wife and then that ceremony goes back to that time. Not all the whole ceremony is about that but there are aspects of it in there so that punuka might have been the time that the uh, bull elk lost his wife 
why we call them bonoka. Because if we lose something or separate from something, we say bon. Um, like, well, the first example I can think of is I have a relative, nixokua. So if I cut ties with that nixokua, I would say nitsi bon bonixokui. So there's that bon, losing or parting with that. If we lose a horse or or our cattle and we have to go look for them, we would say nitsi bonnochki. So there's that bon losing something. So I think that's probably where that bonoka came from. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of explanations and even history in our words. Um, and it's it's uh, like even when we talk about katapitsinix, uh, katapitsinix. Now a lot of people that will try to translate that and even understand Blackfoot, they might say um, that, um, what was the word that I just said? <laughs> oh, I'll come back to it, but anyway. Oh, it's Katapitsniks. Um, so Katapitsniks, and today they'll say those are the legends. And what are the legends? Well, they're kind of like, kind of like maybe somewhat made up. I remember I got into an ar argument at the University of Calgary over this, <laughs> where um, where they're talking about legends, because they're pretty much, I mean, the group that we're with and we're negotiating with, one professor came right out and said, well, as you know, your your life is all about uh, myth and legend. And here at the University of Calgary, are a very academic institution. So anyway, I've got into a bit of a <laughs> argument there, but we ended up winning it. and. Uh, So again, see that's problematic because they're thinking about it as legends and myths and that kind of thing. But Katapitsniksin, if we, if we, so that's the one that they translate to myth or legend. But really what it means is Katapitsniksin. Ka means it existed before or was here before. Tapi is matapi. And then Tsenixin are the stories. So this, these are really stories about those people that lived before us. So they're not legend to us. They're, they're real occurrences that happened. And over time, yes, you know, they start to get, you know, they become like, you know, kind of fanciful stories. But originally they came from, and you have to come to understand where they've come from. So that's really our history is Katapi Tsiniks. Katapi. Those people that lived before us. Another good example of why we need to try hard to, you know, when we hear Blackfoot words, that we find somebody to accurately translate them. So that we don't perpetuate something for a long time. And that's, uh, I guess that's something I saw a long time ago, and that's why I do most of my work around etymology, breaking down words, trying to understand every word, every piece of that word. It also helps me understand the language much better, our way of life much better, even our history. Now, one of my, the late Narcissus Blood one time, uh, you know, were he, myself, uh, 
Ryan Heavyhead, who's now Ryan uh, First Diver, he changed his last name. We were teaching in the Kainai Studies Department, that's a program that we developed in it's about us, you know, teaching about us. We know a lot about everybody, but yet we don't know enough about ourselves. So that's why we developed that program for our own people. So anyway, you know, this is kind of off the topic what he was talking about, but it's about archaeology. So one day, you know, I, I go visit Ryan and, and Narciss in uh, Ryan's office and he had a chalkboard and Ryan would have words up there and he'd say, can you tell me about this word? So I'd break them down for him and tell him the stories. If there's any attached to it, then I remember he would always end with, uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> it was always his uh, ending comment. But anyway, one of those days, uh, we didn't really talk about any words, but then Narcissus started talking about archaeology because he was taking an ar archaeology course in, uh, at uh, the University of Lethbridge. So he was all excited about the new things that he was finding out. And then he was talking about uh, uh, stone flakes and how he said you could match these up with, you know, even if we find another rock and you look at the ripples and it, you can tell it came from that particular. So he was talking about all of this stuff. And when he was talking about that particular part about for, you know, the impact and then the ripples, I turned to him and I said, uh, so how would you say that in Blackfoot? <laughs> now, I wasn't trying to be smart. You know, I was just, like, it just struck me. How would we say that? Because there's a lot of, concepts we in English we don't have in or any other field. You have these concepts but we don't have the words for them yet. And um, and he's a fluent speaker and he knows a lot of the old language too. And uh, so he said, I don't know, he got me. I don't know how he would say that. And he said, well let's work through it. Let's um, Okay, you're saying there's an impact point, and from that impact point, there's these, uh, there's these what look like ripples. They kind of gradually get bigger. So if you think about a pond or a lake or any body of water, and you take a pebble and you throw it in there, what's going to happen? And somebody said. Uh, well, it'll splash. <laughs> well, yeah, it'll splash initially, but what happens after that? And I told him, so that toward lands, then you're going to have these ripples in the water, right? Well, yeah, right. And uh, I said, so what do you, how, would, how do you say that, those ripples in the water? And then one of the older, we had one of, one of the older elders in there, and he said, well, we say, Oh, Oh, So that first part, Oh, is the important part. The second part, Kimishka, that refers to liquid. So that, that liquid has ripples. First part, Oh, is ripples. It literally means up and down. And, uh, so I told him, so we got the piece of it right there. So how do you, when we speak about rocks, how do we, what, let's say morphemy that do you use? I didn't use that word on them, but, um, so they were thinking, and I told him, well, what do you call a rock? Okay, so anything that happens with that rock is, um, there'll be duk in there. So we got oh, bay, duk. and then so it's happening. So if you put all of that together, now we got the description of it. It's oh, bay, So rather than oh, bay, kimshka, it's oh, bay, So it's the rock that's rippling. So I told him, so now you got one of your, because he, he gave it, I don't know, you, you know, there's archaeologists in here with 
know what that technical term is, but I told him, so that term that you used, well, that's in Blackfoot, that's how you would describe it. So now you can go back to your class and brag, I got a Blackfoot word for it. <laughs> so we just worked that our way through it. So in the same fashion, you didn't do it, do it in reverse when I hear these words, well, then I'll break it apart. This means this, this means this, this means this. Okay, now I put it all together. Uh, now I got the answer. This is what all of this means. So, unfortunately in Blackfoot there aren't I think I can confidently say, you know, there aren't uh, many people outside of me that can can do that kind of work. It took, you know, probably three decades to get to this point where I can look at a word and be able to just break it down. There are others that have tried, but when I check their work, it's, you know, it, uh, it's, not, it's not accurate. For one, they're not totally fluent in the language. And the other is they haven't done the research among our own people and the language. And uh, they're just not putting in the time. It takes a lot of time to get to that point. But there's a lot of valuable information. You know, I've taken the, taken the language and uh, one day I was asked to uh, to take over an environmental studies class. Last minute, I had about two hours, and I was busy during those two hours, and uh, I accepted the challenge. I figured, well, okay, here's another way I can find out how to use our Blackfoot language in, in another field of study. So I took on that class and where I started right from was the language. And uh, so in the end, you know, I didn't have the answers to start with, but I worked with those students and we went through it. And in the end, we saw the difference between uh, when you use in with the English language, there's no life in anything. And then as soon as we switch to Blackfoot, everything comes back alive. No, I didn't make that conclusion because I asked them, so what happened? And that's what they said. That we noticed that this killed everything. And then when when you changed it to Blackfoot and discussed it in Blackfoot, it all came back alive. So language is important in many, many different many different fields. Not just in the area of linguistics or English or language studies. Uh, sometimes takes a little bit of work, and uh, and if we put in that work, then we'll be that more accurate in a lot of our conclusions.